Let's get back to a place where having one follower means more than having thousands. Status updates really mean something. And friend requests are the ones you don't mind accepting. A place where the likes are real. The tears aren't emojis. And chats actually happen in rooms where the only thing that needs a filter is the coffee. Team meetings are the ones you're happy to join. And you can spend your time strolling, not scrolling. So whether it's by train, bus, bike, or on foot, let's get back to the real world with a real social network. Transport for Wales, the real social network. Noswinda, Chryso, good evening and welcome to the TFW Lab Demo Day. Firstly, I'll set the scene. Why are we all here today? Over the last two years at the TFW Lab, we've been working extremely hard behind the scenes to innovate, to fix business challenges throughout multiple departments, whether it's commercial, safety, engineering, maintenance, the list goes on. Why is this important? I think what we learned over the last two years is the human race is extremely vulnerable than we thought. COVID-19 showed how very quickly something that's practically impossible to see by the naked eye can affect us all in a much greater way than we ever thought. This is the reason why innovation needs to continue so we can build infrastructure, build a transportation that's fit for purpose and fit for the future. That's why it's important for TFW to showcase what we do here today. And it's also important to showcase the startups who have worked extremely hard to develop minimal viable products in a very short amount of time. When we mean short amount of time, the teams work in a 12 week sprint races with our innovation teams. Throughout the two years, we have worked with over 40, sorry, nearly 40 startups, and we've had an excess of 300 applications to join our program, which I think is an, an example of TFW and Wales leading in innovation, especially when it comes into transport. The other key milestone for us is Cohort 4 makes TFW Lab the longest established a real accelerator program in the United Kingdom. And that allows us to compete and find the best talent to come and solve the critical issues we need to solve. What you'll see today is not the full breadth of our startups, 
but we have handpicked from cohort one, two and three our top talent who are going on to work with TFW and some of you in the room will already be familiar with them. At the end we've got three startups who are actually pitching from this very cohort. So this is very new to them and very new to the business and most of you in the room. We are moving into industry 4.0. The world of IoT and cyber is moving at an incredible pace and one thing that we always look to strive to is transparency, governance and accountability. And this is the showcase event where TFW Lab hold themselves accountable for the work we have delivered as a collective. Innovation isn't always about new technology. It isn't always about the new shiny things, the new phones, the new apps, the new software. Sometimes it's about fixing the very simple business pain points we have with simple process change. It might not seem innovation at the time, but over a long time we all see it as an innovative shift within a business that's helped us all move forward. So, that'll be me done for today, I think, from talking. Um, some housekeeping I need to go through. So on your lanyards, a couple of things. You'll see you've got a green side and a red side. So keep in thing with COVID, unfortunately. Um, if it's on green, you're happy to shake hands, be in close contact. If you turn it inside out, turn into the red side, it means you would appreciate some distance. There's also a QR code on there. So if you scan that QR code, it will bring up the agenda and the run times for today. We have no, thankfully, fire uh, emergency plans. However, if there is a fire uh, alarms do sound, you have two exit points to the rear, one to the right and one to the left. And as you can see, I should have worked for British Airways with that. Um, so running order for today, we're going to start with two keynote speakers. We'll then head to see our first five startups, followed by six, with another keynote speakers in between. And we've also got five, uh, five awards to give today to the very special startups who uh, thoroughly have deserved it. To join in with what we're doing today, please do follow us on socials. So at Twitter, it's at Wales Lab. And we're also on YouTube and LinkedIn. So to search for Labs by Transport for Wales, and please follow us and share us and connect to everybody within there. So, it gives me great pleasure to welcome David O'Leary, Chief and Commercial Experience Officer for Transport for Wales to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I hope you can all hear me okay. Oh, just about, I think we can now. Uh, welcome to tonight's um, event. It really is a pleasure to see you all here, and I mean that literally. Uh, for the last two years, we've all been used to seeing each other in a box like that size. Uh, so today, you're seeing me in 3D, and I'm sorry if that's a disappointment to any of you. So um, welcome to tonight's event anyway. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to say thank you to, to Imran and to the Outlabs team for setting up what looks to be a fantastic evening tonight. Uh, really looking forward to seeing and hearing what people have got to say. Um, my pass will be on green. I'm not wearing it at the moment. Sorry, I'm social distancing. Um, if you'd like to come and have a chat, please come and say hello and be more than, more than happy to have a chat with you. Innovation, I think, is something which over the last couple of years has become something even more important. So we've had to change the way that we've lived our lives in the last two years. And that hasn't been temporary. I think we've all experienced that actually life has changed permanently as a consequence of COVID. Not necessarily a bad thing, but it does mean a lot of change. I mean, for example, how many of you have actually used cash or taken cash out of a cash machine in the last month or so? I know I haven't. So things have changed, and with that comes a space for innovation. There's an, op an opportunity to do something different, an opportunity to think differently. And within Transport for Wales, we really want to embrace that. We want to see and hear those ideas and we want to get to the root of those problems that exist every single day. So for us as a, as a transport operator, that's something we're really keen to do, is to make sure we understand very clearly 
What are the problems? Where are the opportunities? What things could we do to make experiences better for our passengers every single day? And that's the challenge. What a great challenge to have. So I know that as we go through these events, I have every confidence we're going to see some great, inspiring ideas. They may just be ideas to start with, but they have a lot of potential. Everything that's around us came from an idea or an innovation. It came from some, someone's bright spark somewhere. So we need to embrace that. We need to look at how do we use that to make transport even better in the future. So I'm not going to say too much more for tonight. Um, I just want to say thank you for all for taking the time to be here as well. Enjoy tonight's event. Thank you again to Imran and to the team. And I'll hand you back to Imran uh, to, to carry on with the evening. Thank you. Now, for our main speaker, as you can see on screen, some, most of you will be very familiar with this incredible individual, Simon Gibson, CBE. Simon is also the chairman of Alacrity, who are a, a, a very long-term partner of TFW Lab. Um, and Simon is also the chief executive of Wesley Clover Wales. And in 2018, in the New Year's Honours list, uh, Simon was appointed the commander of the British Empire, uh, having an upgrade from his OBE. So it gives me great pleasure, and please give a round of applause for Simon Gibson. Good evening, everybody. Uh, you're probably wondering why some old guy who's bald with a tie is uh, asked to speak to uh, such a youthful group. Well, uh, what I want to do is I want to share with you some observations about pitching and presenting, because a lot of you are going to do it in just a few minutes' time, but more importantly, you're going to do it throughout your entire professional career. And I need to tell you that people that can effectively pitch and present, in my opinion, are in the sort of top 5% of the workforce. Um, I cannot understand why people would start a business, create a great piece of... Uh, intellectual property, you know, write a dissertation, and prepare its presentation of it so poorly. So the credentials for me being up here is, uh, I was a, I'm a poacher turned game, gamekeeper, I was a serial entrepreneur, um, I had a 400 million exit, an 8.6 billion dollar exit, and a 150 uh, million dollar exit, and then I started to switch to the other side, which is to support uh, new companies. Terry and I have invested 500 million to date, uh, and that's, that's created uh, nearly $14 billion of return. So that's the credentials. I tell you that because on that journey, I've had to raise hundreds of millions of dollars of funding at early stage, intermediate stage, and in public markets. And you learn things when you do that process. And trust me, I learned it the hard way. And so I want to share some of those insights with you, and I hope something I say today touches you, you'll learn something, and you'll be able to use something practical going forward in your professional careers. So let's start off with, you know, in your, your imagination creates a reality. We're seeing guys out here with new businesses that started out just as within their imagination. And in so many cases, that commences in the modern age with you, your ability to present it and communicate your, your idea or your invention. A great idea, a policy or an innovation can live and die on its presentation. Quite literally, I've been in situations, and no doubt you will be in situations, where a well thought out pitch will make the difference between literally millions of pounds of support or absolutely nothing. And often that's determined in a, 30, a 20 to 30 minute meeting. So what I'm going to say to you is make sure when you have that opportunity, you give it your best and you present your proposition in a way that's worthy of its presentation. So the golden rule, it's never about you. It's always about your audience. It's not what you think at the end of it. It's what your audience thinks that really matters. You do not communicate by saying something you understand, but by saying something your audience understands. And it's particularly a problem in both technology and in medicine, because we almost speak a different language. And often people with money don't understand that language. So you need to translate it down. 
I'll tell you, many years ago, I, I, I chaired a telemedical conference. It was a nightmare, because you had kind of medics on one side, engineers on the other, and neither could understand a word the other was saying. We literally had to stop the conference and tell everyone, you need to translate what you're saying to, so the other group can figure out what the hell's going on. What we want every time, if you're on the receiving end of a presentation, is something that's interesting, simple, understandable, and to the point. Okay? What we often get, probably 90% of the of cases, I've got to tell you, it's boring, it's complicated, it's ugly, and it's lengthy. We want an aesthetic experience. An aesthetic experience is when your senses are operating at peak and you're fully alive. I've got to tell you, the flip side of that, which is more common than the other, is, of course, the opposite to this, is to have an anesthetic experience where your senses are dulled, you're deadened to what's happening, and you're losing the will to live, listening to a pitch. Okay? Look at this. This is kind of what most people would say if you've got a 20 or 30 minute pitch, what you're, what you're dealing with. You've got this critical evaluation period, and if you're t talking about a 20 or 30 minute pitch, your destiny is going to be determined in that orange block. It won't be determined after 20 or 30 minutes, because by that time, you've lost your audience. So, how long have you got? It's thought you've got less than six minutes to make impact, okay? To land uh, your, your killer punch. So, you're taught, traditionally, you give an introduction, you make a proposition, and then you reach a conclusion. Do not do that. <laughs> it's, a de it's a route to failure. I would suggest, don't waste time telling people how great you are, or what you've been doing, or uh, you know, your history. It's irrelevant. They want to know what the hell have you got and why should they be interested in it. So flip it. Go straight in, hit them with your proposition, do the justification because you'll have plenty of time to justify your claims and then um, you've got the end bit of it just to review the commitment that you got out of someone after six minutes. And I can tell you, as someone who's a recipient, I've been in situations where after 20 minutes I still haven't got the slightest clue what the person's doing in my office and what they're talking about. And of course, am I going to invest in that? No, obviously not. What we call the beginning is often the end, and to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we, where we start from. Good advice from T.S. Eliot. Okay? Questions to ask from the outset are quite simply, how might the world be different for the audience after I make this presentation. I had to ask that question tonight. I was asked to speak on something else, by the way, and I completely ignored it. <laughs> because I wanted to talk to you and leave you with something that's of practical use in your professional lives. So, how might the world be different? Well, you'd, you'd be well to consider a think to, uh, sorry, a from to think do matrix. What are you thinking now? What might you think after the presentation? What are you doing or not doing now? What might you start doing or stop doing after the presentation? You need to think that through before you go in the room, if you're going to have the, uh, the right impact on your, on your audience. If a presenter understands the audience frequency and tunes to that, just like a radio, the audience will be moved. If the audience is on a different frequency, you're in trouble. Remember this, those of you who do O-level or GCSE, depending on how old you are physics, two tuning forks tuned and manufactured to the same frequency. You strike tuning fork A. Tuning fork B, if it's at the same frequency of resonance, starts to vibrate, despite the fact you haven't touched tuning fork B. You've only struck A. It's creating, through sympathetic vibration, resonance. And resonance then equates to amplification. That's how you win in a presentation. You find resonance and you create amplification. So, when our messaging is resonant, we create sympathy and amplification. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. When you go fishing, you bait the hook, not with what you like, but with what the fish likes. I've learned in life, and this is a really important message, right now, so I'd like you to know this, that in order to amplify your message, you need to simplify it. Leonardo da Vinci said, simplicity is the ultimate form of sophistication, and he's absolutely right. It's not easy to do it, but it's essential. 
When you're giving a pitch or you're selling something, you have to answer the who, what, when, where, why, how questions. And if your buyer or your investor's not moving, it's typically because you haven't answered one of those six essential uh, elements that you need to move a transaction forward. And you need to establish one big idea. Don't put a presentation with 15 ideas in it. It's one idea. And that's the well in which all the other elements of your presentation need to resonate with, or else you'll confuse an audience. And here's another bit of advice. Do not open up your laptop when you're, you're, you're asked to give a presentation because you'll open up PowerPoint. And what is PowerPoint? It's a colorful list generator. And you will not create good presentations with lists. Okay? So go out and guys, get some post-it notes, write them up, stick them up. You can get friends in, you can talk to them about your pitch. It's easy to move the, the order around and you'll get a much better presentation. And try this exercise. Tell me what you do in one single tweet. And you'll be amazed how many people can't do that. You'll be amazed how people, how many people, I, I say to them, what can you do? You've only you've got a, a tweet to tell me. And they can't do it. Senior executives can't do it. It's harder than you think. Why is this important? Okay, let me give you a reason why. You get invited to, I'm hesitant to use the, the example of Downing Street, but you're, uh, let's, the white, no, no, let's not use the White House. <laughs> you're introduced to some really important people, a really important person. And they say, what do you do? How long have you got? Have you got 20 minutes? Have you got six minutes? You've got a tweet. And if you can tell them what you're doing in a tweet, they're likely to say, that's really fascinating. I know some people that can help you. I'll introduce you to a venture capitalist. I'll do this, that, the other. If they can't understand you or you haven't achieved resonance with the person, you're screwed. Uh, I just want to show you this quickly. This is one of the best corporate presentations of all time. This is when Steve Jobs launched the iPhone. I need to remind you, before you watch this, there were more than 100 technical patents that were new and novel in the iPhone. Now watch. Well, today we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. The first one is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. The second is a revolutionary mobile phone. And the third is a breakthrough internet communications device. So, three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. And here it is. <laughs> no. Actually, here it is, but we're going to leave it there for now. I've got to move on, but um, his, his timing and delivery was superb. He used the trickle on, the power of three, and he trickle on to trickle on. Did you notice? He used Zen-like graphics, 100 patents, who cares, he didn't mention them once. He helps the editors along. Every journalist goes back to the, the editor, and the editor goes, what's the, what's the headline? 
What do you think the headline was the next day in the, in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Sun, Time magazine? Apple reinvents the phone. That's why he said it twice, so that every journo in the room clocked the headline that they were going to do. Tempts the audience, pulls the phone out, puts it back. A rare, a rare uh, uh, instance of Steve Jobs demonstrating humor. And he sets up the solution to the problem. So, of course, iPhone wasn't a, pro a phone at the time. They were creating a platform. They revolutionized micropayments. They revolutionized the music industry, created the app store with more than a million apps on it. They, they uh, you know, redefined publishing, and they introduced cloud storage computing for consumers. There are three essential elements in a successful message. And I'd like you to particularly note this as well. I describe them as three A's. The first one is authenticity. Your message needs to be true, it needs to be authentic, and it needs to be able to be justified. The second thing you need is amplification. If it's simple and you can communicate it to a third party and they like it, they will be able to communicate it on. You've got amplification. Even better, if you can then get that person to advocate for you, they're not only passing your message on, they're also putting their reputation on the line by saying, it's really good. And that's priceless when you can get people to do that, including investors. Pitch structure, tell me about your purpose, tell us about your progress to date, where you're gonna take the, 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 uh, your company with the funding, and make a personal commitment statement at the end. This, by the way, is often forgotten because people aren't thinking about the audience, they're thinking about themselves. What does an investor want to hear in the pitch? If you, uh, we give you this money, what are you going to do with the money and how much money are you going to make us? And I noticed the difference between UK pitches and the American pitches. The Americans are really good at showing what the outflows are going to be from the investment. It's almost in a British pitch, it's hidden in the back and you have to ask, like, okay, we give you a million dollars, what will we get back? And people can't authentically answer that. Really important that you get that pitch structure if you're going to talk to VCs. If your message is clear and authentic, it will be amplified. If your message is also advocated, you're more likely to win. And it's as simple as that. So now it's your turn. Good luck, everybody. Wow, what a talk. Um, there's a lot to take away, and I think the, uh, the startups that we have today will probably resemble a lot of the stuff that we've actually done through the lab work, which kind of resembles uh, what Simon um, has just talked about there. When it comes down to pitch practice, pitch prepping, getting your key messaging right, some of the work that the startups do is working on an ad lib statement to say, look, how quickly in a very short sentence or the good old elevator pitch can you actually prescribe your business to somebody when you've only got a short amount of time? So we're now going to start with the startup pitches. So the format, following very closely to what Simon said, where they've been given, you go six minutes to actually get the buyer's interest, we've put our startups under a bit more pressure. We only give them five minutes to catch your attention and to get their message across. So, First startup we're going to bring on stage is from our very first cohort. And the startup, when they applied, ticked a lot of boxes for TFW. One is, how do you improve navigation around station? How do you improve accessibility requirements and needs for the people who may need further assistance? So it gives me great pleasure to open up with Freddie from Bright Yellow. Hi everybody, I'm Freddy Nonyelu, founder and tech lead at Bright Yellow. We provide a data capture platform that enables smart stations. Over the last few years, I've led my team through uh, collaborative R&D projects in high-performance computing, remote care monitoring, and connected passenger guidance, building for the platform of our solution today. Our mission is to provide the most powerful insights, actionable insights for transport operators to enable them to grow their revenues 
by improving customer experience for all. And yes, that includes the disabled. And making more efficient use of their assets, their fixed assets and their people. Our journey started in 2017 on the Billion Journey Accelerator through the Intelligent Mobility Accelerator and here at the Transport for Wales Accelerator where some of the magic happened. We have since gone on to evolve through paid pilots by Department for Transport on the Accessibility Improvement Program working together with Transport for Wales and with Department for Culture, Media and Sports on the West Midland 5G program, working with Transport for West Midlands and West Midland Trains. I said the magic occurred here at Transport for Wales because that's really when we discovered that there was a problem. 6.2% of the population don't use rail. Even That's 4 million people. And even worse, the 10 million registered disabled people, for them, public transport is a nightmare. They don't know what's inside. They don't know whether they can actually get out through the station before they leave home. And that's scary. So we set out to solve this problem. But let's take an example here. Sean, a single mother, two small kids, and her mum, Andrea, 71, has got arthritis on both legs. They want to go on a journey from Pontypridd to Shrewsbury via Cardiff Central. Andrea imagines those stairs and her knees, and she thinks, mm-mm, <laughs> I don't want to go. And Sean thinks about the two kids and the luggage up those same stairs, and she thinks, maybe we better drive. So that's the lost revenue for operators from people not using trains. So we've set out to solve that problem. We quickly realized that the solution was three things. One, virtual reality. So you can see inside the station, understand what's there before you leave home. Two, augmented reality. So that when you're there, you can be guided with haptic guidance, voice control to your destination without getting lost. And three, smart wearables that have precision so that when you're going through those large multimodal stations, independently, you know that if something went wrong, there's somebody on the end who knows where you are and can help you instantly. So we've built this, and this is what it looks like. So here's our app. Before you leave home, you've got the data from our sensors telling you how crowded it is before you even leave home so you can choose the best time for you, if you're autistic, for example. And then here's the virtual tour, interactive tour, so you can see what's inside that station, plan your route, make any changes you need to make, be sure that you can get through. And then here's the augmented reality with voice control, haptic feedback that takes you from outside the station all the way inside the station. We've improved this, even from this demo, to add new features so that we can guide those that need guiding around obstacles, fixed obstacles, and even crowds, areas of congestion, so we can guide them safely around those all the way to the right point to catch that train. So you imagine this as part of a Transport for Wales app for a customer who, has, who is disabled, improving their user experience and guiding them to that endpoint on the platform to catch their train. Here's an example of the wearable. But what about for the operator? Is these insights from our sensors. Now they know not only where the uh, crowding is occurring, they can benchmark different parts of their station. They can benchmark different stations. They can forecast. We can give them forecasts of when crowding is going to happen, overcrowding, so they can mitigate and move resources, move staff, have them at the right place at the right time to improve experience. So I ask you to imagine our solution now for the 10 million registered disabled users, 
the four million people that don't use transport, public transport at the moment, what would it be like if more of them could use sustainable public transport? With our system, we can start to do that. Our dream is for this to be available on all train networks, on every operator. We're already working with Transport for Wales. Six stations in Wales, three in the West Midlands. We want to make this available everywhere. Just like train line, you use it because it works. This works. We've proved it. We've demoed it. You've, this works. This is real. So we can make this happen. It's hard to do, but we can do it with your support. If you'd like to find out more, come and speak to me on our stand. I'm Freddy Nonyero. Thank you. Great presentation there by Freddie, and it just goes to show you the advances that in Apple OS, Android OS are enabling new startups to actually deploy on their technology to build applications that has a much wider reach. And yes, it's difficult to build, but the impact could be phenomenal. Now, for our next startup, again from Cohort One, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Chris from Passageway. Hello everybody, I'm Chris Johns. I'm one of the co-founders of Passageway Smart Digital Signs. Our cities and transport authorities around the world face a common problem. They all need to get many more customers onto the public transport networks. This is both to recover the revenues lost during the pandemic, but also to meet the UN 2030 sustainability goals. But the problem is that a lot of the access points onto the public transport network were designed and built for a paper-based age, so are no longer fit for purpose. And we believe that by using real-time information that we can make a difference. A lot of our work is based upon the thinking of these guys. I don't know if you've ever come across them. Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein produce this book called Nudge, which is all about the idea of liberal paternalism and nudging behavioral change. And the idea behind it is that you can nudge people into making a choice that's not only the best one for them, but the better one for society and the environment as a whole. But the cornerstone of that process is to make the decision simple. And that's what we've done with public transport. So what we do is that we transform any connected screen into a real-time digital sign, displaying detailed route information, onward travel status, disruption notifications, and much more. And by doing so, what we do is that we remove the anxiety that many customers feel when they're considering public transport as their transport choice. We've worked with Transport for London for a number of years, and their internal research has shown that when they add a real-time digital sign to a location that didn't previously have any real-time information, they see demand at that place increase by about 50%. So we know that what we do works. Now, the image you've got here is for a bus shelter, but we also do signs that link places like stadiums and schools. And during the pandemic, we put, or TfL, put in digital signs in all the hospitals across London to help the staff and the patients and the visitors, such that they were, get home and get to the hospital. We were one of the winners of the inaugural uh, Transport for Wales lab. And our digital signs, we deliver them as URLs. And the idea is that they're as simple as they could possibly be. So there's no registration. There's no login. There's no heavy download. All you need is an internet connected screen to be able to see the information. And we extended that idea uh, for Transport to Wells to come up with this idea for a personal passenger information system. And basically how it works is that it was for the um, pre-booked leisure sector. So when people bought their tickets, either online or in the machine at the station, uh, we would insert a short URL uh, code into the ticket receipt. And people would be able to enter that URL into their device, whatever device that was, and they'd be able to get a personal journey information digital sign, showing all the details of their journey, plus other stuff around it, like how much parking there is at 
the entry and exit points for the particular stations, onward travel status, audio guides, plus how to contact the onboard guard. Now, unfortunately, the pandemic came in the way of that one uh, being progressed. But what we got from the accelerator was a relationship with Transport for Wales and the lab. And so when this next came, idea came up, we approached Transport for Wales, and they loved it, and so now we're doing it. Uh, and what we're doing is that we're bringing true train information to rural train stations. So what we're doing here is that we're taking the live geolocation of the train and then enabling customers at the rural train station to be able to scan a QR code on a poster and open a personal digital sign with that true train information. So it's not timetabled information, it's the actual geolocation of that train. You know, a lot of startups, well, I can only speak for my startup, actually, the, the, one of the reasons why we do accelerators is, A, because we want to build relationships, B, we want to get momentum and traction. And that's what we got with uh, our experience from working with the Transport for Wales Accelerator. And I just want to talk a little bit about where we've been since we've been on that. Uh, so we just agreed a new multi-year contract with Transport for London. Uh, we're rolling out about 120 plus smart bus shelters across the London borough of Croydon. And we've just completed prototypes, which you can see on the screen in the re reception area, for uh, Melbourne. We won a global innovation tender to work with their innovation team. And, you know, what has been great is to take our experience of working with Transport Wales and the sort of understanding of how the larger organizations uh, work together and, and with people like us. And we've, been, we've enjoyed it very much. We enjoyed working with TFW. We enjoyed Alt Labs. We enjoyed working with the, uh, the rest of the cohort in, as well. And it's been a great experience. And we're looking forward to working with them uh, in the future as well. That's me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, again, what we've just seen there is a simple bit of technology that we can actually all use. How many of us have actually been into a different city using multiple transport modes, not too sure where to go? Google Maps isn't always reliant when you don't have a signal. And it's technology like this and startups like this can really help us move forward. Now, as I said in my earlier talk, we, you know, we don't always look at the shiny stuff. Sometimes we really need to look at the safety and critical elements and protecting our colleagues across the network. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Kale Ash from Spatial Cortex. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kale Ash from Spatial Cortex. At Spatial Cortex, our vision is reducing workplace injuries through revolutionary technology. Did you know the sickness absence in rail industry is twice as much compared to other industries. Musculoskeletal disorders, or MSDs, are a major source for this. MSDs affect workers who carry out manual handling as part of work. MSDs pose significant challenges to the rail industry. Every year, the industry lost tens of thousands of working days and tens of millions of pounds due to these. In addition to the huge legal and complaints impact, MSDs affect the long-term health and well-being of staff who are crucial for the success of rail industry. According to ORR, lack of consistent and informative risk assessments are an important reason for increased injuries in the rail industry. Conventional manual handling risk assessments are subjective. They are only suitable for simple tasks like lifting a box, and they can't provide detailed insights into the touch points that has to be targeted to prevent injuries. We have a solution for this. Welcome to MOVA. MOVA is our patent pending technology that combines our hardware and software technologies. Our hardware involves a set of variable sensors that attaches to workers' work wear. MOVA software interprets the sensor data real time into important injury risk parameters. MOVA can provide health and safety teams with great insights into risk factors, when they exceed safe limits, and what to target to minimize the risks. They can also provide information so that they can develop targeted interventions and track the effectiveness of implementation. 
In the long term, MOVA will be able to offer real-time alerts to workers and teams based on risk levels. We can truly enable a preventative and proactive approach to health and safety. Before the lab program, we were just testing our technology on controlled environments. The lab program gave us a great opportunity to build and validate our MVP in a live environment of the rail industry. We had great support from the stakeholders, and we validate our MVP on track maintenance, a sleeper change task. As part of the MVP validation, we had two workers who were actually wearing our sensors, and data was recorded over the entire shift. Here you see two examples of how MOVA software helped understand the instances where the risk levels were quite high. On top, we can see the video of the tasks themselves. In the bottom, we can see the risk factors tracked by MOVA. Comparing those to HSC's permissible limits, we can see when and where the risk factors exceed safe limits. And we found that it was a combination of forces and posture that was leading to elevated risk levels. Fortunately, we were awarded as winners of the program during that cohort and it gave us additional funding and uh, additional support to carry out for additional extended proof of concept validations. We have been working with the fleet team and the infrastructure team to do that in the last year. On the sleeper change, we have been evaluating alternate tools. For example, a long handled shovel instead of the standard one to target risk minimization. The findings were so against conventional wisdom. I don't want to get into a lot of details, but I'll be happy to share in the stand. But you know, information like this can help develop improved methodologies to target risk minimization. One task that we assessed at Canton Depot was the risk of pulling a point during shunting. We understood how posture-related risk factors could be amplified by factors like stiffness of the points, which can be minimized by routine maintenance, for example. We also analyzed a cleaning task, which helped us understand the risk of repetitive arm motion, level of exertion, and range of motion. Things like this can be prevented by better administrative controls and alternate tools. We also evaluated a brake block change, which is a routine train maintenance activity, and we found out instances like that led to increased risk levels, like uh, postur postural constraints and instances with repetitive exertion. We are currently scoping a follow-on commercial project with Transport for Rails to continue the work that we are doing. We have long-term ambitions to take our solution to the wider rail industry, and we believe the experience that we gain with Transport for Rails, for Rails today will help us a lot, lot with that. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And if you think we can help you with things like this, or if you want to find out more, please get in touch. Kailash from Spatial Cortex, thank you very much. Amazing technology that's been worked alongside TFW, but actually has a much wider reach in across multitude of sectors. If we can look after our colleagues, help to prevent injury and strain, we can actually run a more for continued service with more upkeep. So it's a great way of demonstrating by using some clever data, clever sensors, and the amount of information we can get and actually changing some little tools here and there can actually make a big impact on us as human beings and how we perform. Now, for our next cohort, uh, sorry, for our next startup, I'd like to introduce Root Connect, and one little fact is they are very good at crazy golf, uh, which we found out yesterday. So I'd like to welcome Mohammed from Root Connect. Hello everyone, my name is Mo, and I'm the CEO of Root Connect. We are the Google Analytics of physical spaces, and we provide video analytics for traffic surveyors, local authorities, and rail operators. Now we want to make our cities as efficient as they can be, but to do that, we need to understand how we move across our cities in real time so that we can make proactive and dynamic decision making. And from that, we can begin to tackle the huge climate and fuel wastage issue that we have across our cities and encourage uptake of multimodal transport. Now, to give you an idea of the landscape, I'm going to take a famous quote from Batman, The Dark Knight. You either die a hero with basic analytics 
or you live long enough to start to use facial recognition. And one of the biggest players in this space, being SenseTime, raised $620 million at a $4.5 billion valuation, but was blacklisted from trading in the USA and pulled out of the UK and European plans because of how they were using the facial recognition technology. We are changing the landscape for the West with our technology. Now, rather than traffic analytics uh, being sent to um, uh, traffic surveyors in India and Bangladesh to be manually counted, what we do is we begin to automate that entire process. So we can anonymously look at how vehicles and people uh, are moving across a space, and we then map that out through our algorithms on a 2D map. And that starts to create uh, pathways, and we maintain that continuous pathway. And we can begin to aggregate those results to get a heat map and a good picture uh, of these desire lines um, that can then be filtered even further. So you can start to say how many are going uh, to the top junction the right way, and how many are actually entering the wrong way. And that can allow decision makers and planners to not only improve efficiency across the junction, but also make design decisions to improve safety. Now, what makes us unique in this space is that we are able to connect the dots across multiple points of a, of a route without using facial recognition and without using number plate recognition. And so that opens up the floor to us to not only work with existing camera systems, and, and well, that does allow us to work with existing camera systems, and that expands the scope um, for our customers. What's more, our error rate is two and a half times better than the benchmark in this space, and it's 10 times better than the Wi-Fi counting solutions out there. Now, since the lab, we have secured a 100,000 pound grant with Zenzik that allowed us to work with uh, test beds, uh, one of them being in London, and provided us with access to hundreds of their cameras uh, in the London borough. Uh, Traffic surveyors are also keen to adopt our technology, and we've got good interest in the rail sector as well, uh, from Alstom and Nomad Digital, as well as Transport for Wales. So we are at maximum capacity, um, and we're keen to get our technology out there. The market size has also grown. So video analytics from 2016 to 2019 tripled in size. And with the 770 million cameras across the world, we are in a good position to make the most use of that with the way we have approached this market. We're primarily focusing on roads right now and in the coming uh, year and two years, uh, looking at rail, but we're also keen on other uh, sectors like retail, stadia, and events, such as this one, for example. And our core team of three has our advisor, uh, Nigel, who is the ex-COO of Keolis, and prior to that, CEO of Transdev UK and Ireland, overseeing their £150 million London bus operation and its merger with Veolia Transport. Now, our business model is to provide the analytics at £250 per camera per month. And you might be asking, are councils willing to invest in that sort of technology? And we've seen councils uh, work with some of our competitors to adopt basic versions of these analytics, and in one example, they secured a bid uh, that was between half a million to a million for 12 months of analytics across 100 cameras. So the technology is there, and councils and uh, customers are willing to invest in it. Last week, we announced our funding round of £780,000, uh, backed by the Development Bank of Wales, who are here today, uh, Pi Labs, SFC Capital, as well as Plug and Play, who were early investors in Google, Dropbox, and PayPal. That allows us to double our team over the next year and provides us with a runway of 18 months. And in the next round, we're looking to secure at least two million pounds. And so for us, next steps is to expand the team. We're already at full capacity, so we're keen to get our technology out there. And if you have any uh, projects over the coming uh, year uh, where you're interested to try to understand uh, uh, movements across the space and you want to w tackle those challenges, then do also feel free to uh, reach out after the talk. Thank you very much, and uh, look forward to seeing you after this. Really interesting technology. Yeah, again, a different way 
to monitor things, to find out some traffic and data, to help planning and everybody around the network, not just within TFW, but the wider council partners, to really understand what's happening with traffic flows. Now, next startup joined us in cohort three, and as we've mentioned earlier, it was always interesting doing um, the accelerator programs during COVID, so we were consistently on Microsoft team calls, using tools like Mural out of hand. As it was remote, it enabled to, to actually extend our network reach from across Wales into the UK and into Ireland. So I really like to give a really warm welcome to Patrick, who's flown in from Ireland, to really show us what the future could look like. Hey all, uh, my name is, hi all, <laughs> my name is Patrick from uh, Utility AOR. Um, we now live in a digital and remote working age. I think if that was unclear before, two years ago, it's very clear to us all now. <clears throat> However, um, while we as office workers have a lot of digital tools available to us to help us get our work done, that's less so the case with workers out in the field. However, things are changing. 75% of organizations have started looking at deploying digital tools for their workers who are out in the field. And we want to be part of that growth. So what we as a company are doing is trying to find ways to provide workers with the information that they need at the right time it should be the right and appropriate information only for what they need to do at that time. And it should be easily visible to them and accessible to them um, uh, for the job that they're doing. We, at this point, are working with about 100 companies across Europe and the world. We have cu customers all over the world who are using our technology to do this. And how we're doing it is augmented reality and smart glasses. So what uh, augmented reality glasses are, different from virtual reality, where virtual reality closes you off from the real world, AR glasses are transparent and see-through. So the worker still sees everything around them as they did before. However, now within their vision, they can also see digital information uh, that is appropriate and relative to what, relevant to what they're doing. And also, there's a forward-facing camera and that means that the glasses understand where they are in the world, what they're looking at, and what's the appropriate thing to, to show them. So when we spoke to TFW, the, the challenges that they have are all around growth. So there's a lot of new staff being brought in, there's growth plans, there's a lot of new equipment coming in, and it all has to be trained upon and understood. So a worker's job is becoming more diverse and more challenging than it ever was before. There's also more staff churn than there was before as people don't see jobs as jobs for life anymore. And there's more of a requirement to um, record exactly what training workers have got um, from, from the organization. So our tool, which can be used on um, augmented reality glasses or, for example, a pair of smart glasses like this one, what they, what they allow is the worker wears these glasses, and here's a picture of Phil from um, the training department in TFW, and what he can do is he can look at an, a, a, an asset, the glasses will recognize what he's looking at, and show him the appropriate information about it. In this case, a training, um, procedure, so he's going through a step-by-step -step procedure on this piece of equipment. He's on step two right now. He'll say next or he'll click next and he'll move on to step three and it'll show him text or video um, or images on how to do each step as he goes. He can also record images and videos of what he's seeing as he's getting going along through the procedure. The, the tool also automatically deploys into a phone app as well for those who aren't ready for smart glasses. Um, so all the same content is equally available on our phone app. And there's a back end which manages exactly who's done the training and we can see how long it's taken them to do that training as they go. 
Another part of the tool is, is about remote advisor video calling. So that's where Phil here is on a train, he's looking at an asset, and his colleague can see in real time what it is that he's looking at, can chat to him about what exactly he's seeing, and can draw annotations on the live video, which are visible to Phil, to describe to him what it is that he wants him to do next. And what we saw during COVID particularly was there not being one person on this end of the call, but rather there being five, 10, 20 people all joining the call um, uh, for walkthroughs and audits, things like that. So we're Utility AOR. We're offering tools to help people use this type of technology. We have a stand just outside. Happy to chat to anyone who wants to see it or, or, or have a go. Thank you very much. The future's really here. I think RoboCop won't be too far behind. Um, before we go to our break, a five-minute break, can we please give another round of applause to our keynote speakers and our startups from the first session? So we're just going to have a five-minute break. Please feel free to use the bar. The restrooms are on my right, your left. Um, and please return to your seat in five minutes' time. Thank you. Simon Gibson, I'm Chief Executive of Wesley Clover Corporation. When I first started out as a technology entrepreneur, things happened in a serial manner. You know, one technology was developed, another one was following, and then another one would follow. What we're witnessing now is a parallel innovation where quantum computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, 5G, you know, ubiquitous access to cloud. Uh, computing infrastructure, ubiquitous uh, access to bandwidth, all coming at once. And the opportunity to innovate over the top of that is just unprecedented in human history. So my advice to startups is you've got to be absolutely persistent. Too many people give up too early. But persistence also means you know, you've got to be committed to sacrifice your time and all your efforts to whatever your adventure is. Think about there's very little, there's, there's, it's unusual that anyone comes up with a truly globally unique idea. So what that means is there's someone else trying to do exactly what you're doing elsewhere on the planet. So it's about persistence, it's about hard work ethic, and it's about you know, hiring the absolute best talent. Not people that you can control, but people that will bring that extra spark. Hire people better than yourself in what you need them to do. And, uh, you know, if you add all those things up, put them in the mix, you have, your likelihood of success goes to the ceiling. I'm Marie Daly, I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Transport for Wales Rail. I'm here today at TFW's Demo Day to see the great work that's been done by the team at TFW to work with small businesses to really bring innovation to life within our business. And it's exciting times for us as a business, it's exciting times for Wales for us to see these great ideas turn it into solutions within our business to deliver for the customer and to live for our people. So innovation means to me that we are looking at things through different lenses and ways of working that we take for granted day in day out are great, they deliver what we need but having the opportunity to look at those in a futuristic way or in a different way means that by working with a range of partners we can really create a solution that delivers for our customers and delivers for today and tomorrow. So my name is David O'Leary, I'm the Commercial and Customer Experience Director at Transport for Wales. I'm here at the TFW Demo Day to really get to understand some of the great concepts that are being uh, created by some, of these, um, by some of these companies. I'm really looking forward to it. I see some of the real challenges being around how do we change the way that we deliver transport after a, a pandemic like COVID. 
and really looking at the ways in which we deliver our services and our uh, products better than we have before. So I think innovation can really help us uh, come up with some great ideas to change the way that we do transport and, and deliver it better across Wales and the border regions. Yeah, due to the demo day and our deeds, we need to have a look at our community help each other out cohorts, just driven and all. Um, you can tell me well no we never we never ready to come no claw or the whole cover body that I'm in tour and all just teams. Um, I have it. If we drink the a core that startup series that's true the our petrol cohort with that. Adalvani, I would like to get a Pubinara to read with TFW. Welcome back, everybody. Before we kickstart the final startups and go to the awards, we've got a very important keynote speaker up today. This individual works tirelessly with the labs team and oversees the principal spot, uh, innovation strategy for the organisation, and I spend too much time with this gentleman on the phone. Um, so it gives me a great pleasure to welcome Barry Lloyd from TFW. Thanks very much. Welcome everybody, it's great to see you all. Thanks for coming, I hope you're enjoying the first half and uh, the second half with more to come. So I wanted to talk to you this evening about our process. So what do we do? How do we go about agreeing any problem statements? What do we do with the applications? Uh, how do we deliver the accelerator? So we end up with some fantastic evenings like this. So a lot of time and effort goes into making the program as it can be, and I want to talk to you about how we can do that. So we meet with our rail exec, we meet with our group exec, we meet with our SLT, we meet with as many people as possible to try to get as many of the problem statements defined. So this is done via a lightning decision jam. You see some of the images behind me of the, uh, the actual work that we do, or a creative problem solving session where our directors and heads of functions are asked to note down the areas of focus for their function, for their line of work, but also for the wider company too. So first we capture what's working well. So it's a strange place to start with defining problem statements, but we do a lot of good things, and we do a lot of good things really, really well, and it's great to start the session talking about the things that we're good at. Plus we spend way too much time talking about problems in work anyway, so it's nice to have 10 minutes or so talking about some positives. Then we capture the problems. So these range from items like the Wi-Fi isn't great on board, or we've got loads of data but no insight, or how on earth are we going to deliver this transformation activity that we've been signed up to? As you'd imagine, we spend a lot of time trying to draw these out so we have all good current problems to give to the cohorts ahead. Then we prioritise the problems, so everybody in the workshop has 10 votes to cast. So those 10 votes then are cast across those array of problems that we've defined, and the ones with the most votes are the ones that we take forward. The ones with the fewer votes are already recorded, they're not discarded, they're not thrown away, they are real problems that we still need to work on, and we capture them and we come back to them at future workshops. But this is to define the problem statements to push out to our startup community. So we turn these business problems into how might we statements to frame the problem correctly. So we've, used, we've got lots of data, but no insight turned into how might we turn our, use, our data into usable information and analysis. That makes the problem a real world problem for our guys to help come and work with and help sort out. We've got the problem at the end, we've got the problem at the start, and now we know how we're gonna to get to the end. We work, out what, we work out what to make into a project. We work out what to make into a task. And that's just based on time frame, on cost, and in resource. And then what we have left is what we develop into our problem statements. So the process is undertaken to ensure we focus on the customer, focus on the end result, but ultimately to ensure they are real and current problems that we need to fix within the next six to 12 months. So these statements are issued out to our startup and scale-up community, as well as our website via our social media channels. We're the only transport operator at the moment that clearly defines its problem statements and publishes them for everybody to look at. This is really well received by the innovators that we've spoken to and it's something we're going to continue to do. So applications are made via a website called F6S, a growth community website. There is a numerous jobs postings on there. There's a lot of op application options on there. It's a really good place that we have a presence. So since cohort one, we've had over 300 
individual applications to, to join one of the four cohorts. It shows that there is interest in the programme and that we're delivering the right statements to engage the people that want to work with us. All the applications we get are, are reviewed and graded. Films are watched, research is done, websites reviewed, so we can understand more about the applications. Those we like, we earmark for further review and for second opinions. For any close calls, we'll re-engage our, se our senior leadership team to provide any support that we may need to move forwards with. Once we've got that right number for presentation day, we'll set that up and invite key stakeholders in from the function that propose the innovation so they can help understand how we can move forward. It's a Dragon's Den type style event. So we managed to do the first one of these in face to face in our headquarters. Fantastic couple of days engaging with people. The, pre, the, 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 the next three unfortunately had to be done virtually but we're really looking forward to getting back into our head office, inviting our, our communities in, seeing the presentations, bringing as many of our stakeholders into the room as possible so they can ask the questions that are really pertinent to them. The best ones make it through to the accelerator. The number of the pro on the programme is dependent on the quality that we see. So this year, this, like this cohort, for example, we've got three people come through. The first cohort, we had 12. It really is dependent on what we feel is the right thing for our business at the time and what we feel ultimately we can support. Because what we found is we want to need to convert the stakeholders into mentors. And to get a really good mentor really helps improve the outcome of the process. We've had some great mentors over the, over the last two years, some really, really fantastic input and time. And this is on top of what they're asked to do as part of their job. But there's a real benefit for people engaging. Everybody gets something out of it and we as a whole get a better outcome as well. So the programme itself runs over 12 weeks. Uh, the aim ultimately is to enable participants to collaborate across the innovation sector and across Transport for Wales. It's designed to help refine and develop a product that is fit for purpose and for them to make a pitch to decision makers at Transport for Wales today. The weeks are focused on challenge play box, challenge playbacks, product development, stakeholder workshops, producing any project plans, and then ultimately a presentation of the MVP, the minimal viable product. So the mentoring and the development is really the most important things that I think that we can offer. We give access to stakeholders, we give access to our infrastructure partners, we can have access to Welsh Government support from Business Wales and the Development Bank, full access to our data and our current thinking, alt-lad strategists, designers and engineers, a network of investors and access to the transport operations. I'm not sure there's anything I could actually offer that we don't offer there. And that's a pretty good package for nothing, for engaging with us and helping us move forward and help release and improve some of our business problems. We have the re really well received Rail Immersion Day. It's always a highlight of the programme. We actually take everybody out on the train. We talk to our colleagues, we talk to our customers. We engage with the stations, we engage with the infrastructure, and that really does help people frame the situation that they're trying to present the problem for, or present the solution for. It helps set up and really set the scene to present back to us today with that final presentation. So I'd just like to take this time now while I'm on the stage to thank a few people. So Mike Davis, really well done. Mike's our innovation manager. Um, he's not taken part in talking today, but he's been running around the scenes like a madman. So Mike really helps the programme come together, and I really want to appreciate and send my thanks to Mike, but also to Imran and his team as well. You know, we wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be here doing this today without all those efforts. So thank you for you two gents standing up over there. And without any further build-up, I'm going to hand you back to Imran, who's going to introduce the last few speakers from Cohort 3, and they're really exciting, the speakers for Cohort 4 are looking for our investment today. Imran, back to you. Thank you very much, Barry. Um, one of the interesting things that we had a discussion on was last year, Barry and Michael, on every Tuesday at 10 o'clock, we have our innovation team stand up, where my team, the TFW team, get on the call and we go, right, what's our plan for this week? 
how we're innovating, what we're delivering across the week. One of the calls was, can you actually run one of these LDJ sessions for our executive team, C-suite? I was like, sure, who's involved? He went, every single director we've got across TFW and TFW Wheel Service coming together with Marie, Jan, Alexia at the senior figureheads uh, appointed to the session. More importantly, it was the first session together in one room since the COVID restrictions. And for us, that was really exciting because it was, we were turning their usual board meeting upside down on its head when they've turned into this quirky place with soft furnishing, whiteboards, blackboards, and about a thousand post-its. And we were, you've got an hour and a half to work with our team and we're gonna try and get the bottom of some of your critical challenges today. A lot of people just looked at us and went, what are these guys on? But as Barry's explained, we got through that process in an hour and a half with a effort versus impact matrix, which we used to score all the projects and all the challenges. And the great thing from that was we were seeing actually COVID was no longer at the top of the agenda. It was the stuff like we want to see better data. We want to see better connected journeys. We want to see how the uh, modal transport across TFW comes together. And that's what we did in that session. So when we say innovation starts from the very top, for us in the labs, it really does come from the top and we drive it into the business. Now, enough of that. What we're going to do now is go to the last six startups of the program. Um, and for us, uh, this one's a really, really interesting one. There has been incidents literally in the last week or two involving um, a digger hitting one of the trains and catching fire. A lot of the Welsh network is unmanned. We don't have the infrastructure to see what's going on and the control room sometimes have to run blind and wait on responses. So this startup has came up with a really, really interesting solution that can revolutionize how this could all come together and actually support the network. So give me a great pleasure to welcome Howe from RoboK. Good evening, everybody. My name is Hal. I'm a co-founder and CEO of RoboK. We are a computer vision startup and we build AI-powered visual insights. Survey shows only about 1% of the surveillance videos are actually watched live. It's very boring to, watch, to be actually watching uh, screens and videos all day. But it's also very important to not lose out on the potential insight you can generate from understanding what's happening. And this is why we set out to transform the always on monitoring with AI. Originally, as the technology spun out from University of Cambridge Computer Science Department, we're now a team of 15 and growing, and a team of world-class researchers in computer vision, deep learning, and embedded software. And because of this unique combination, we are developing highly robust computer vision software for low-power compute platforms. Because of that, we're able to process more streams, more visual data, with less compute. And our patented technology in turning 2D information into 3D data creates a holistic seeing understanding that can be then used to create useful insights for our users to make more informed decisions. And we are able to integrate with existing camera infrastructure, such as CCTV cameras and other types of portable cameras. And today, we're already delivering our solutions to the key industrial customers, also in the verticals of automotive, transportation, and logistics. During COVID, actually in the first year of, of, of I think in 2020, the, actually the travel on public transport significantly reduced, but the statistics on the number of level crossing incidents between near misses, about near misses between vehicles and people actually increased. And what's really happening there are people using the level crossing for the first time because they're spending more time at home and actually using this for exercising or um, other type of leisure activities. So it was really with the goal of understanding how are people using them and when are they using them? What's the question which we set out to answer? 
And with the support of the stakeholders from TFW, we initially scope out a uh, feasibility study of can we use a portable camera, a battery power camera, to collect important data about what's happening at those crossings and analyze them so that nobody has to manually review those data. It's also not about actually how many people are using them, but actually what type of users and how are they using them, what are the behaviors to really trying to unlock why are the incidents happening. So during the 12 weeks of the lab program, we were firstly using some public available data to prove the concept of can we process those low resolution data and to actually generate insight that's important for the users such as the demographic information, uh, the, the tracking of movement and the dwelling. And having proven that, we were very fortunate to be the winner of the last cohort and then won a contract to actually work and implement our solution at a real level crossing site. In particular, T-Glass was chosen as the site because of its high usage. On a daily basis, there's about seven to 800 users of that crossing, mostly for commute purposes to work, to school. And what we did is we used a portable camera and with the data we process, instead of actually spending days of reviewing the footage, we were able to use our AI and to actually understand the subtlety of the data, which comes about the classes and the categories and the demographic information about the individuals. Not only that, we're able to actually unlock a lot of the insights about safety, security, about how long are people dwelling on the crossings, and are there kind of abnormal behaviors, and what are the causes of them? So trespasses and dwelling are the, the key ones. And also when the crossings get crowded, it's also become uh, more risky. So it's not only just about being able to alert when actual incident happens, but well before that, about understanding how your users are using the sites. And we believe that is the key solution to be able to address that risk. And by knowing exactly what are the type of people and actually turning those information into visualized statistics allows our stakeholders to make more informed decisions about how, what's the best way to actually address where should they actually market this awareness um, campaign, as well as are there any types of changes they need to make at their sites. And it was with great pleasure for us to actually learn about, because of the output of our work, the stakeholders were actually able to make site changes about um, actually the level crossing to make them safer. With all the input from our stakeholders, as well as the iteration for our, from our hardworking team, I'm proud to introduce you to Raven Insight Platform, where it's a scalable insight platform for monitoring that could be used for um, on-site monitoring, indoor monitoring, outdoor monitoring, powered or unpowered. How it works is we can connect to existing cameras or other types of mobile cameras that's either on a car or even on a drone. By processing the data with our proprietary 2D and 3D AI-based uh, software, we are able to create a holistic scene understanding about what is happening, what is the asset, what is the object, what is the type of the movement, and what is the trajectory, how far they are, at what speed they're traveling. And based on this wealth amount of data, we can then run deep learning algorithm to be able to pick out not only the um, entrance into particular area, but also identifying anomaly in the data. And with those data, we can uncover several different types of analytics, including in how efficient your assets or people or uh, vehicles are, are moving, and are there any kind of potential safety uh, breaches. And also, the users can use those data to make better decisions on asset and site planning. So what is next for RoboK? Following the initial commercial uh, deployment, we're now actually in the process of rolling out the solution to more crossings and actually being able to make those crossings safer. And by actually covering a larger number of the crossings, we are able to then compare the statistics across sites and across different times when you can actually analyze what is the behavior of users after you have done some infrastructure changes. And this creates high level of visibility and transparency of these sites, because these sites are traditionally unpowered, and there's no 
actually fix camera solutions to tell you what is going on. And we've also recently been awarded a funded multi-year R&D project with Network Rail and with the support of TFW. And we're actively looking for other types of verticals within the rail industry to see where our solution could be connected to. And our goal is to connect to more cameras, analyze more data, generate more insight to help improve safety, security, and also help plan assets better. So if you're interested to learn more about our solution, we have a stand here and happy to chat. Thank you very much. Phenomenal bit of innovation looking at actually, when it comes to safety critical things, safety critical data, the technology doesn't have to be over sophisticated. So going back to what I said earlier, innovation doesn't need to be over complex. Working with these amazing startups, such as RoboK, you can actually come up with really clever solutions who are extremely bright to be able to come up with technology at a click of a finger. They can pull data that can actually change and hopefully one day go and improve the infrastructure and hopefully save many lives across a lot of the crossings that we have across Wales. Now, to follow up from RoboK, we have another amazing startup. Um, Will from Robot Cube. Got that? Cubot. There we go. I've just asked him this before coming on stage. I've been getting it wrong all day, by the way. So apologies for that. So please welcome Will uh, from Robot Cube. I've still got it wrong again. Thanks, all. Um, thanks, Imran, for that introduction. Uh, so the name of the company is, is Cubopt. My name's Will. Um, I'm the only person in the company, so it might be easier to just call us Will. Um, so what, what are we all about? Um, I think if there's one message that I want to leave you with, it's that we believe in feeding your imagination with data. And the reason we think that's crucial is that the problems in the world that are hardest to solve, the problems that arise because of things like coronavirus or climate change, are all problems for which there's no simple solution. And normally they're difficult to solve because we don't have a model yet as to how they work. And traditionally, the way that we use data doesn't help you to answer these questions. But it's not normally so great at kind of providing inspiration for solutions. And I apologize already for, for the kind of gratuitous use of a, of a genius in a slide. But I think his quote sums it up really well. Imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces the entire world, simulating progress and giving birth to evolution. And if, if it's not too grand, then I think what we're trying to do is the second part of this. If you think of data currently as knowledge, what we're looking to do is use data to try to stimulate evolution. And the way that we're looking to do this initially is through allowing users to ask what if questions. So what if we had made different decisions? When we look at the rail network, when we look at the problems that we, that we looked at in allocation, if we could go back in time and change the decisions we made, would it have led to better or worse outcomes? What if conditions had been different? So can we change the circumstances in which we're operating? Can we change the weather and see how it would affect outcomes? And then finally, and this is perhaps the biggest one, what if we could change our constraints? And so that means what if we could take actions and make interventions which currently maybe even fall outside the scope of kind of current common decisions? We think being able to answer these questions allows two fundamental changes to the way that we address business problems. The first step is diagnosis. So if we can ask the what if and we can answer the what if, then we can find out what causes uh, poor outcomes. And if we can identify what causes poor outcomes, we can start to experiment and identify what optimizes those outcomes. And so working with the fantastic people at TFW, 
we've been able to apply this approach to a real world problem, which is short form allocations. Uh, that is when uh, there's, there's no available train unit of, uh, to satisfy a service with sufficient number of carriages. And what we've done is we've taken the data relating to schedules, re relating to train locations, and we've used that to generate a dynamic model of the world. So this tries to predict at any one time what the state of the network might be and what the next state of the network might be. Using that model, we can go back in time, we can make an intervention on the data and see what we think would have happened had some particular property been different. So if a different decision had been made. We can also then take that model and run it forward and try to imagine what will happen given some set of input data, some set of decisions. So working with short formations, what we do is look at the short formation that's occurred. We identify the list of allocation decisions over time that contributed to that. And then we start to sample from alternative decisions. Doing this, we can say, right, this short formation occurred over the course of these decisions. And at each stage, the range of possible options to avoid the short formation narrowed by some percentage. When you get these big drops or these big jumps in the percentage of a short formation happening, that's the decision that contributed materially to that occurring. So it starts to tell us why the short formation happened. And what we can then do is look to find the alternative set of decisions that would minimize that risk of the short formation happening. So we go from diagnosis to optimization. Now, I appreciate that we've not gone into a lot of detail here. Unlike some of the others, we don't have any, any uh, screenshots to show you. But that's kind of deliberate, because I'm hoping you'll come over and speak to me more about this afterwards, and we can show you something. But before I leave, I would just like to say once again, thanks to the incredible team at TFW. Thanks to Michael, to Imran for setting up uh, this entire accelerator scheme. And if I think there's one thing that, uh, again, I think would be great to leave you with, it's the idea that you know, there are people out there who are applying this imagination that we talked about already to try and solve some of these hardest problems. And I think we've already heard from some of them this evening. We'll hear from some more uh, as the evening goes on. So thanks a lot, and please do come over and speak to us. Thank you, Will from Cube Opt. There we go. It's only taken 50 attempts. The next startup, I've had a privilege to actually work across several accelerator programs across the six, seven years I've known them. And every time, they never fail to amaze on their progress and the new technology that they keep pushing out. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Daniel from Junction. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, as Imran said, I'm Daniel from Junction. Uh, I've actually been working in the rail industry for about eight years now uh, across a number of different areas, including performance analysis and asset improvement. Um, but as Imran said, Junction's been around for six, seven years, but I've only been there for a few months. Uh, so a lot of this stuff is actually new for me too. Uh, I'm just going to say, talk a little bit about what we did as part of the uh, incubator with Alt Labs. Um, but also as to kind of where that's led to us being now. Uh, so I'll just move to the next slide. Uh, Junction are a uh, company that is focused solely on the rail industry. Um, so we want to try to build solutions that help to uh, both improve the passenger experience, reduce delays, and improve uh, freight operations as well, which is often a somewhat overlooked element of the rail network. Uh, we, we take a sort of problem-driven uh, approach. So we don't go in and say, we've got a tool and here you go, this is, this is gonna fix all your problems. We spend a lot of time with our stakeholders really trying to understand exactly what their problems are and how we can help them. Uh, and that has resulted in a number of sort of uh, solutions. Uh, I'm gonna just talk you through a few of them here to give you an idea. So on the left-hand side, we've got our decision support tool. Now this is being used by uh, a number of TOCs around the country uh, in their control rooms. It's used effectively to monitor when disruption happens, what we can do to improve uh, the passenger experience, i.e. reduce delays. And we do that by effectively taking huge amounts of data and then looking to predict how, uh, basically what's gonna happen uh, and what the best decision to be made by control would be. 
The second one is sort of a follow-on to that. So the second one is a customer experience information system. So once all that disruption is happening, and once those decisions are being made, it's really important that the passengers know that's happening so they can make decisions around it. One of the issues we've uncovered through our sort of consulting approach is that effectively the, the customer experience teams in the control rooms found it very difficult to sort of get hold of that data all in one place when disruption happened. And basically it meant the passengers weren't receiving what they need to receive as and when they can. And I think someone earlier on mentioned that that's one of the biggest bugbears for uh, passengers at the moment. This system brings it all together and allows them to quickly get that information out to exactly who needs to be. The third one there, Auburn, is the one I'm going to talk a little bit more about. So Auburn was the product that we developed as part of the TFW uh, incubator. Auburn is, uh, well, effectively, before we get onto what Auburn was, as part of our sort of research process, uh, we spoke to a number of stakeholders, particularly passengers uh, and those uh, who were disabled, and particularly those with autism. And we uncovered that many of them felt that, that despite the fact that they would occasionally use the train services, it was not an enjoyable experience for them, put them off, and it became an even bigger problem during COVID. Uh, so we want to try and tackle that. What we've developed then, Auburn, is a journey planner and a uh, sort of personal assistant application that brings together, again, multiple data sources into a really easy to use user interface uh, that allows them to sort of adapt their journey both beforehand and during. So for example, if you don't want to be in places with large crowds, you can tailor your journey and say, I'm, you know, that's, I don't want that, and it will effectively provide you a journey that is different to the one you usually would. Now obviously we'll say that might take five minutes longer, but maybe that's worth it to that individual. And it'll also provide the sort of information we have about accessibility uh, and kind of make that experience a lot more enjoyable for them. As part of that process, we worked with TFW uh, and Alt Labs, who were fantastic. Uh, and as a consequence of it, not only were we able to implement this for TFW, but we've actually implemented this for TFL as well. So in terms of where we are now, uh, as I said, Auburn has been uh, released for uh, TFW and TFL. Um, but again, thanks to the sort of introductions that we uh, received as part of this project, um, we actually worked on other projects with TFW. So we worked on a consultancy project with a cons uh, the control room, uh, where we got to look through the various tools they have and advise as to how they could be improved to improve operations. Uh, but more generally now, we're focusing a lot on the sort of performance and data analytics side of things. So for example, we're now working with Network Rail on a timetable validation project. So we're gonna use real time to the second granular data to validate, is the timetable working? and can we make it better to improve performance uh, and reduce delays. Uh, and then the final one I just want to talk a bit about here is the key one I think that I want to get across today is the business change side of things. So it's great to see all these wonderful, exciting tools uh, and you know, it's a lot of hard work, but in my experience in the rail industry, the hardest thing to do is not actually make them make a difference. Uh, it's, it's a industry that uh, you know, is somewhat archaic, it needs a lot of support, and we're going to try to build an offering that allows people to effectively build a change program around these tools so that we actually see the benefits from it on a larger scale. And yes, uh, so final thing I just want to say is what we're going to do next is we understand that GBR's sort of trajectory is to bring together Network Rail and the train operating companies into one uh, sort of vision. Um, so our solutions are not going to be sort of just here's, here's this for you, talk, here's this for you, Network Rail. We're going to try to look at it as a whole. Uh, and then the final thing is we're going to continue this problem-driven uh, approach. So we've developed a number of sort of problem statements, and rather than go around and say, you know, we can fix this problem for you, we'll, we'll let the industry decide and make sure that we can adapt our solutions to those problems. That's it from me today. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, if you'd like to have a chat, I'll be on the stalls out there. One thing I would just add to what Dan has said is over the years I've known Junction, they've actually gone on to actually support other startups who are working in rail at the very moment. So through serendipity, through these programs, through collaboration, the startups actually learn to build partnerships between them and actually support each other to build each other's platform further as well. So yet again, it's another great example of the, the TFW Lab community and the Accelerator community that exists. Now, we've seen the startups from Cohort 1, 2 and 3. Now a lot more exciting time. We've actually got the three pitches from Cohort 4 and these three pitches are looking to bid for business from TFW. 
So, to get us started with cohort four and the final cohort, from North Wales, Billy from Cufflink. Good evening, everyone. Hi, everyone. Pied Croeso, Noswithai Chigid. Um, my name is Billy, and I'm CEO and co-founder at Cufflink. And as you can tell from my GOG accent, I'm from the north. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you um, about cybersecurity and regulatory compliance. Yay! However, before I do, I'd like to ask you a personal question. What's your worst nightmare? Now, I'm aware it can involve sometimes, it's a very personal question, but it can involve sometimes things like snakes or spiders, or even worse, getting LinkedIn requests. But if you're a business leader or company director, I'd suggest it's far more likely to be this, a data breach, or the risk of regulatory non-compliance, or worse still, both. Every 19 seconds, a UK company is hacked. And in around half of these incidents involve the loss of personal data. And this impacts 26,000 people, that's you and me, and costs on average two and a half million pounds. And the problem is it's getting worse. Personal data is now an asset. It has value, and therefore it makes it a target for people to try and steal. And in fact, a single data breach can have far wider consequences for any business with regulatory penalties, subject, uh, litigative actions, and the, the loss of trust by consumers, all impacting any business's bottom line. So what does Cufflink do? Well, at Cufflink, we take your existing personal data, we encrypt it, we split it, and we distribute it. And then our innovative and patent pending data licenses then control the terms of access to that personal information. So you'll always know exactly who's accessing what, from where, and for what reason. Now, as part of the TFW cohort, we were asked to utilize the Cufflink software and to create a secure single view of a customer. But what does this mean? So for any growing organization, they're constantly adding and removing customer data sets. And this can end up, this organic growth can end up creating data silos or disparate instances of a customer, so you don't have a single view of them. So when Mr. Sandeep, for example, signs up using the TFW app, he adds his personal information. He'll then go, and this includes his marketing preferences and also his data privacy and language preferences. And this then creates a data record. Now we take this data record and we then pass the information from within it into Cufflink. We encrypt it and we go via our OPN APIs and we use it to create what's called a single view of customer record. Now this has a unique identifier called a GUID, but think of it as like an account ID. And it's against this that we then store the personal information and we replace it in the source system. So if there's a data breach, there's nothing there to steal. Now, in the meantime, Mr. Sandeep has gone and signed up to a second system. However, this time he's gone and added some different personal information. So he's added his mobile phone and his address in this instance. So by going via Cufflink, we enrich the customer record so that we have a greater view and a more detailed view of what our customer looks like and our data insights are improved. However, we can also spot conflicts where, for example, he'd selected a marketing flag differently in two different systems. Now, again, we can use this information, pass it via the API into the second system, so both systems get to see the same set or the same view of Mr. Sandeep. Finally, we add a data license, and this data license controls the terms of access from both a cybersecurity and also a legal or regulatory requirement. So this is the MVP we spun up. Now, if your eyes are good, I apologize for this, it's very, very small, but essentially what we did is we moved customer data into Cufflink, and then through a simple API call, you can see at the top level we have null data, but then having run the actual API call, we then go and we return the PII, so we can return the personal data. This is what we did as part of our MVP, and how does it affect then the customer? Well, ultimately, what happens then is Mr. Sandeep, on his, any customer touchpoint within TFW, is now able to see his address. 
And he's also got a consistent view of his marketing flags across the enterprise. How does it um, benefit Transport for Wales? Well, therefore, likewise, all of the different areas and business units within the TFW group have a single reference point in which to basically go and look at the customer data. This provides greater data insights and greater um, understanding of how their customer looks. So the next steps for us is we'd love to continue to build on the MVP and then to integrate within the wider TFW data stack to demonstrate essentially cross-system data sharing. And this, was, this would allow us to enhance the customer journey, provide greater data insights, and enforce data security and regulatory compliance across the business. And we're already working with Anglesey Council at the moment. We've gone live to look after the young carers' data. And we'd love to continue to work with TFW um, and to help make the nightmare of a data breach a thing of the past. Thank you very much. As we see more recently, cybersecurity is now coming extremely, extremely important. As we said earlier, Industry 4.0 is going to force everybody's hand to protect all data. Yes, we have GDPR, but the uh, Information Commissioner's Office are getting really hot now on any organisations not really wanting to play a ball or stick with policies. So, yeah, again, a great example from a startup that can actually solve the single customer view challenge, which is not unique to TFW. It doesn't matter how many organizations we speak to, all flag, we want the single customer view, but very rarely do they actually know how to get there. And this is why the startups like Billy's is important to any organization. Now, next, so we've looked at cybersecurity. Now for our next pitch, looking at actually, we see data, but what does data mean? How do we visualize data? So it gives me a great honor to welcome Jonathan from ClickFlow. Hi everyone. Um, as Imran said, I'm Jonathan Galloway, CEO of a company called ClickFlow. We are first and foremost a data anal analytics company. We help businesses leverage their data, generate insights, uh, all with the key goal of um, driving business performance. Right now, this is a very interesting time for uh, this particular industry. It's an interesting time for technology, particularly around the use of um, AI. We've heard lots of great presentations about using some of this technology tonight, but one of the fundamental problems actually remain is the use of um, general business data on a day-to-day -day operational basis. Some of the key challenges often remain the same. It's access to legacy source systems, lengthy business processes, and multiple people that are generally involved. One of the typical scenarios that most people in this room have probably been affected by is uh, an incident that takes place. It affects the customers, it possibly affects the staff uh, and the service that's being offered. Multiple people are generally involved uh, in this because senior leadership are rightfully, in, uh, rightfully involved in their request for information. What can we do to solve this problem? What can we do to take action? What can we do to prevent this happening next time around? Cliffhook can help solve some of the, those problems and more importantly also, support the people who are involved in the process and alleviate some of those challenges. First and foremost, we're a framework that allows you to um, source, organize, and ingest all of your data into one single source of truth. Only then can you begin by creating automated event reporting and monitor the situation in real time. Barry alluded to earlier on in his speech the need for data. People are starved of insights. This is where we offer the ability to analyze this on a much deeper, deeper basis. Back to AI, only at this point are you truly in the right position to be able to have all of your business data into one single place and leverage the likes of, uh, the, leverage the likes of um, artificial intelligence for planning and forecasting scenarios. We're a cloud uh, organization. We leverage cloud technologies, uh, some of which uh, you all are uh, customary to. Um, use it on a day-to-day on -day basis. But what we've got is a great team who have built uh, a very simple framework, a very seamless framework um, that can quickly deploy this single eco um, ecosystem. This helps us get that hard to reach data um, from those legacy systems, particularly this is something that Bus and Rail experience very, very well, a challenge that they have uh, on a daily basis, should I say. Only at this point can you truly democratize your data and be equipped with the best information at the appropriate time. 
through this TFW Labs program, we've been uh, given access to lots of uh, really interesting people from all levels of the organization, both bus and both rail. We were given access to uh, 25 uh, million records as part of this MVP build. These are from different corners of the organization, from retail, customer experience, um, and operations. In true MVP style, it doesn't always go to plan. We've got 12 weeks apart in the program, but we only got access to the data about, I want to say, 12, 13 days ago. But we stuck to our guns and we used our framework exactly the way that it should be. We rapidly deployed this, allowing um, TFW to take advantage and get all of this business data all into one place. Most, import most importantly, talking to one another, which is one of the key challenges. Here we're seeing something which looks very, really simple. This is actually um, Cardiff Station on one particular day between 7 and 10 a.m. All we're demonstrating right now is very easily um, 1,500 customers that are going through the station at the beginning of the, the, the rail part uh, of, of their journey. From a retail perspective, we've got people that are buying, uh, 750 people that are buying um, tickets for their, for their travel for that particular day. They're using the machines um, through the TVM machines, and they're using the windows uh, and dealing with the, the colleagues. On a daily basis, through the weekday, the TFW rail network has over 10,000 stops, which is amazing. Just between 7 and 10, there are 2,100 alone in Cardiff. From a performance perspective, as we can see here, I want to focus on just a very, very small period, it's about 45 minutes. What we're seeing is a slight decrease in performance, but what does that decrease in performance actually mean? What does that look like? How does that affect the customer? What's the downstream impact? Because TFW are using our, using our platform, this data is already talking together. We can really clearly understand what the downstream impact is. And it's 44 customers, and they're making a claim for £1,000 on delivery. That, that, that's, that's fine, that's fair. But that's only one station for um, 100 stops, one station, three hours. Imagine what that could look like with all of the business data, all in one place, accessed within minutes. From a technical standpoint, look at the management of the data. Um, management of the data, what do we have? How do we access it? What does it look like? We can, using um, cloud technology, we can provide a semi-automated data dictionary, which allows uh, self-service disco discovery for any of these users, any of the people that are part of that process. They can see the raw data. They can see the databases. They can see um, the reports that are delivered at the end of it. This is a really simple view of everything that is coming from the source system, everything that's used right through to the business intelligence layer. Industry experience, as you can see, we're quite diverse. Uh, we're picking up manufacturing, retail, uh, and today, obviously, we're, we're looking at rail. Luckily enough, we've worked in rail for several years. We work with uh, London's biggest train operating company, de dealing with over 50,000 stops a day. What we're asked to do for them, and what we hope to do in the future for other rail operating companies, is drive that whole business intelligence agenda and just help them become a truly insight-driven organization. This is real. We have approval to use this. Uh, we'd love to show you this. We wish it was in real time. But actually, what it's demonstrating is the requirement for um, rail and transport in general at the moment. Right now, we're at the biggest, uh, we're at the biggest uh, demand period since uh, the COVID pandemic began. We're at 80% of requirements, which is huge. But there's always going to be a need to improve and optimize the service that's, that's offered. There's going to be a general push to modernize the experience. This could be just one way to do it. And I don't think that we've ever been more relevant. What we'd like to do moving forward is take this MVP that's been done in such a short period of time, and we want to develop this into something bigger for TFW, for you, and for other real partners, and help you really become an inside-driven organization. Dioc, thank you. World of data that dictates everything businesses these days are all dictated on data. The old saying that data is king at the moment. And it's so true. If we can find organizations such as TFW, we can get away from the Excel sheets or 
data stored in silos on different people's machines and when you need that critical information it's not available because the person who has that data on their machine is actually on annual leave. It creates frustration and it creates business problems. Having a solution like ClickFlows it allows you to have information on demand and in real time which I think as from an executive team point of view, from a heads of department point of view is inevitable. Now for our very final pitch representing his hometown of Cardiff proud to bring you Gary from Porter Travel. Hi everyone, my name's Gary and I'm the founder and CEO of Porter. Now I wanted to start by talking about my friend. This is Bethan. Now Bethan's a really passionate environmentalist. She's a full-time lawyer and she's the mother of two children and that means she has very little spare time. When she does have spare time, she really loves to travel. She loves discovering new places and new things to do. The problem she has is when she uses travel websites, she gets really overwhelmed because there's too much information and too much choice. She also doesn't have access to a car and that can make planning travel really difficult. And she's not alone. Last year, 21% of UK households didn't have access to a car. Further, 43% of Brits spend more time planning their trip than the time they spend away. Why? Well, put simply, booking travel is difficult. Now, if we look at what a typical planning process looks like for Bethan, it's something like this. Over the course of about four months, from the very first moment she thinks about going away, through to when she's actually decided where to go and book something, Bethan will make over 7,000 digital travel touch points. This is web searches, website visits, reading blog posts, watching videos. Now that's a huge amount of information to be consuming and a huge amount of time to do something that should be as simple as booking a trip. Now let me introduce you to Porter. At Porter, we're building what we call a digital travel companion. We want to make the whole process of travel as effortless as possible, from discovery and booking right the way through to experiencing and enjoying. Now we recently launched version one of Porter focused on hotel recommendation and booking. The way the platform works is when a user comes to us, we ask them a series of onboarding questions. This helps us understand what type of traveler they are and what's important to them when traveling. When they search, we ingest thousands and thousands of options and we distill that down into a short list of relevant recommendations tailored to each one of our users. Now, 12 weeks ago, we were really excited to get started on the TFW Lab program. For us, this was a chance to explore new product opportunities and ways we could potentially collaborate with TFW. Now, right from the off, TFW outlined a number of problem statements they were looking for help in addressing. And from day one, there were three that really resonated with us. How could they attract new users to rail? How could they solve the problem of end-to-end -end journey planning? And how could they educate consumers around greener methods of travel? So over the past few weeks, we've been working really, really hard on our proof of concept. I'm now going to show you a short video of our end-to-end -end journey planning solution. This is Bethan booking a trip to Cardiff. So the first thing she needs to do is book somewhere to stay. So we show her a short list of relevant recommendations tailored to her. When she's found somewhere she likes, she'll select the room. Once she's done that, we need to help her find things to do while she's away. And again, we show relevant recommendations tailored to her. Finally, we show her relevant transport options. And we also show her the carbon impact of these options compared to a typical car journey. So we know that Bethan doesn't have access to a car. So we're showing her multimodal public transport options, not only to get her from her house to the hotel and back, but from the hotel to the things to do. Once she's completed her booking, she's then able to view all aspects of her trip in an itinerary style format. And here she can access e-tickets for any of the transport that she booked. Now, if we think back to some of those challenges I mentioned that Bethan has at the beginning, she struggles with travel websites because they overwhelm her with too much information. She really wants to discover new things to do. And she struggles to plan trips by not having access to a car she really cares about the environment, so she wants to understand environmentally friendly ways to travel. So let's look at how our end-to-end -end journey planning solution can help people like Bethan. Well, first and foremost, we were able to make travel planning much simpler. 
At each of those three stages, we only showed her the most relevant options tailored to her. Secondly, we helped her discover new things to do in the place she was visiting. And finally, we helped her plan an entire trip, all aspects of the transport considered, and helped her understand the carbon impact of using multimodal public transport compared to a car. Now, we're still quite early in our journey, but we've got some really ambitious plans for the year ahead. This year, we'll be launching experience recommendations and booking. We'll be launching an app version of Porter, and we're really excited to continue work on our end-to-end -end journey planner and hope to move this to beta later on this year. We're now in the process of raising our second round of funding. So if you want to get involved and join us on our mission to make travel effortless, then please come and see me afterwards, or feel free to drop me an email. We're also raising a portion of this round on Cedars, and we'll be publicly live on there next week, so please feel free to check it out. Thanks for your time. A simpler way of booking our holidays, our journeys with sustainability in mind, which is hot on the agenda for everybody. Um, and if we can find the better ways to reduce our carbon footprint when we travel, the better the world will become. Now, I just want to say a big thank you to all the startups who have pitched. So a big round of applause for all the startups who have given us a show. Before I let you all go for food, and as a quick reminder, your food and drink vouchers are in your bags. And I know everybody's rubbing their bellies, going, oh, we're hungry and thirsty. We'll get there in a minute. I would like to welcome Marie, Chief, Chief Operating Officer from TFW, to kind of help us close the ceremony through and to award the startups their prizes. Good evening, the slot before food, so I'll make it quick. Uh, but I have to say it is the most exciting slot because it is the awards. I do have my glamorous assistant, so we're getting the gender balance right tonight, flapping that round. Debbie McGee to my Paul. So um, before I go into the awards, I just really wanted to say thank you for everyone tonight. It has been, for me, a really exciting evening. So you may think I've not got much of a life to say that. But I'm normally sat in really boring boardrooms, sorry Jeff. Um, looking at these issues through the lens of problems, problems for our industry, problems for our business. So looking at some of these key issues through solutions driven by technology, through latest thinking, is just fantastic. And it's left me with loads of ideas, ping, 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 ping. So expect an email tomorrow, Barra. Um, the, the, what I've seen tonight and throughout this whole programme is people who have ideas, and I'd like to think, you know, I've had a few ideas over my lifetime, but turning those ideas into a business, into a dream, you should be commended. I, I don't feel um, qualified enough to be giving out some of these awards tonight. So well done to you. It is inspirational to see. And I think everybody's a winner. So everything I've seen up there tonight, I think, wow, how did you think about that? And, you know, delivering that not only for TFW, but elsewhere, well done. So before I go on to the awards, because I've really built it up now, um, I did notice that three of the awards, um, the first three of the cohorts, um, cover off customer experience using technology, how we can improve that, well-being of our people, which is really important, and safety. So it's really, really good to think if you ask what the challenge statements were three years ago, they would probably be top of our list. So see solutions like that being delivered is fantastic. So I will quickly uh, move on to our first award. <laughs> That's my glamour assistant making sure I do not forget the name. So this is from cohort, cohort One and we've heard to them tonight and I'd like to give this to Freddie from Bright Yellow. Absolutely, this is one of my uh, favourites. It's one I asked Barry for a long time ago, just so giving that accessibility to every all our customers, really important, thank you. So, also from cohort one, so we had uh, two winners, I think we had three, but uh, the third winner couldn't be here tonight, and this is uh, Chris from Passageway. Have you spoke earlier? Right, I've done that wrong, I've got a way that I have to do it, so I've done it wrong, fifth picture. What have you done wrong? I've given you the wrong way, Imran's going to oh. tell me off. <laughs> Thank 
So cohort two, people came back for more. And what I would say, I think over 30 companies have worked with us and over half of those are still in touch with us, if not more. So we've got those relationships. So as I said before, everyone in some way is a winner and we'll continue to work with them. So this is um, cohort two and this is, I forgot what it is. This is Kailash, I knew your name Kailash. It's fabulous. I got it right. Thank you. Okay, so this is cohort free, and uh, I think everyone was blown away, and we're always blown away in um, rail when it comes to improving safety of our people and safety of our customers. So this uh, cohort winner um, is Robo K. I'd like to welcome up How. Thank you. I'm just really glad Simon's not still here before from how to present because I feel like I'll be in serious trouble. Um, okay, so now the winner of Cohort 4, I do feel like I need a jumbie or a bit of a BAFTA award opening. So, um, absolutely fantastic presentations, I'm sure you'll see tonight. It's not been an easy decision because actually, looking at some of those solutions, I know I see them in the business now and I'm like, wow, they're actually in our business and we are seeing them making improvements. So, well done to everyone. We really appreciate it. But there's always going to be uh, one winner. So, for cohort four, I won't keep you waiting. It is um, Billy from Cufflink. Yeah, come on. Turn it round. Turn it around. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around. Oh, the the, the, the. We thought you meant us then. I was thinking this is this going a bit wrong here. This is yeah. Thanks for that, Adam. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, we're having a team photo now. Nick's as well. Nick's is all in. If anybody's got red on, they're going to feel got caught, uncomfortable now. A lot of things have been said tonight um, about this programme, so I'm definitely not going to repeat those. But I did want to take the opportunity to say, you've heard about the programme, you've heard about the challenges, the way we operate it, doing this during COVID, staying engaged with businesses and making it work. Well, we are really, really proud of uh, the lab at TFW. And most importantly, we're really, really proud of both Barry and Mike who are making this happen. They really passionately care about this. They really passionately care about all of the individuals who come through the cohorts. And it wouldn't have the integrity and credibility it's got without their hard work. So I'd first like to get a round of applause for Mike and Barry. And then I'll also take the opportunity to just recognise, sorry, what's your name again? No, Imran uh, from Art Labs for the relationship that we've got with Imran. Imran is not only working alongside us with the lab, his uh, ability to want to see us improve, his passion for that, and I felt that Imran's worked with me on our in-house reward pro um, project and really demonstrated how much he wants to make things work, use technology, use latest ideas, and work with um, small businesses to do that. So I'm going to ask everyone just to give a massive round of applause for everyone at At Labs, but particularly Imran. <laughs> and I'll definitely get off stage now and hand over. Cheers, Imran. Right, brilliant. Thank you for that, Marie. Right, to close off before you go and run for your food straight away, quick couple of announcements. Handsome chaps to, to, to the left of me, which you all kind of get to know him now, Michael Davies. So, a couple of things for the business we just want to point out from us, from the innovation team, what's happening next. So, we have offered the Lightning Decision Jam to every single department within TFW reach out to Michael to book a session and we can do this remotely through Teams and Mural and it only takes an hour and a half. Now just imagine how many wasted meetings do you all go to and know that because I keep my, some of my meetings do get bumped because people are going to a meeting to stay on mute. Why not have a session in an hour and a half and we can really help you prioritise some of the challenge statements you actually need to solve as a team, as an organisation, as a department. 
Secondly, we've got the next cohort five. The work doesn't stop at four. We're already working towards cohort five, which will be coming later on this year. Sandwiched in between all of that, we actually do an internal accelerator program where we take the ideas from internally from TFW. You get to join a five week program, one day a week is all you need. And my team and the labs team will actually help you build that solution out. And you actually get to pitch it back to the execs and hopefully get budget sign off so we can develop that into a reality. And we've now done that in a couple of occasions already throughout the business with some really great results. Last but not least, we also have the hackathon coming later on in the year. And the hackathon is going to be based around a challenge statement set by the exec team. And what we're doing is gonna challenge all the universities in Wales to compete against each other, to send the brightest and talented to solve a problem in 24 hours. So it's a high intensity, you imagine a 12 week accelerator program in 12 hours to solve a real problem that the business is having with some rewards and gifts for the winners and everybody taking part. So that's everything for me. Thank you all for coming and taking your time. You may now go and enjoy your food. Thank you.